again. So, um, I was, in my visit to Cuba, I was amazed at the grace, intelligence, um, and morality of the Cuban Revolution. It's a country, I think, that um, really does need to be recognised as the most important country in the world. And um, its health, education, and welfare system is exceptional, let alone the doctors inside Cuba and around the world. Um, and this revolution provided that for Cubans and also the Global South. So it's a very important revolution. And this talk is, is based on that premise. But I also want to acknowledge that the social gains, particularly in the early phase, was very much around um, Afro-Cubans and women, and that the LGBTI community didn't do as, as well as the other, um, particularly Afro-Cubans, as the other um, very marginalised community before the revolution and so on. I want to look at the reasons why, but I also, this the conclusions that I've come to is that Cuba is far more advanced in LGBTI rights than the United States of America, and certainly um, advances more rapidly as a result of the revolution um, than Australia. So that's also the conclusions that I've come to and, um, and we'll get there. But what I wanted to do, this talk goes through really four sections. One is looking at the impact of Spanish colonialism and also US imperialism, how that distorted Cuba and its natural development. Um, the Cuban Revolution and its early years and its advances and then how the revolution treated the LGBTI community within the early period and then current day. Okay, the other thing that we've got to explain a little bit is why is it that uh, queer people... ...are oppressed um, in a sexual and gender way. So, uh, society in a, in a homophobic manner said repressed. And the, um, the one difference with that is the, um, the, the Mayans were good, but the Central Mexican indigenous crew, the Aztecs, weren't so good. So the Aztecs actually were very um, uh, horrid against sodom uh, what, they, well, what is referred to as sodomites, that is homosexual men, um, but the Mayans were very, very expressive uh, in, in a whole range of ways. Um, transgender people were um, revered by the Mayans. So, different, but generally speaking across the board, pre-class society, pretty good. Spaniards, by um, in contrast, were very brutal. Conquerors, this is a Latin American se sexuality writer, Max Mejia. Conquerors treated sodomy as special Indian sin and hunted it down and punished it as such on a grand scale. They orchestrated crusades like the Holy Inquisition, which began burning sodomites at the stake. Um, so, in particular, on the, on the Cuban um, experience, there's a number of historians, particularly Arbules and Rich, but they looked at the fact that Spanish colonial authorities castrated those they considered sodomites and forced them to eat their own testicles coated with dirt. So, very brutal. Um, now, of course, the Spaniards to Cuban indigenous were brutal across the board. They didn't just particularly par target sodomites. Indeed, you know, they almost wiped out entirely the indigenous population. But colonialism and later imperialism brought this anti-homosexual sentiment and anti-trans laws and state repression to Cuba. Um, so then we look at the development beyond the Spaniards um, and, well, a little bit before, being that the, there was, of course, an uprising against the Spaniards' brutality. People know here um, the Cuban history uh, quite well, no doubt. But 1840 saw a wave of Cuban slave revolts culminating in a sustained war of independence in 1868. Um, but it wasn't until the Second War of Independence in 1895, inspired by José Martí, um, that Spanish rule was broken. However, imperialism eyed the Cuban prize um, and a brutal US military occupation of Cuba began in 1898. So from 1902 to 1958, US finance capital insta installed two iron-fisted dictatorships, Gerardo Machado in the late 20s and Batista in the 1950s. Under Machado, cross-dressing Puerto Rican labor organizer Lucia Capatillo was arrested in Havana in July 1915 for wearing men's clothing. She was a single mother 
a revolutionary and a respected labour organiser, and she waged a battle in Cuban court for her freedom, um, and she won that battle. So that's one of the first um, experiences of uh, cross-dresser um, campaigning against the homophobia, and she won, which is a good, a good one. So, OK, um, but, uh, until 1959 then, Cuba was a US neo-colony, and the US corporations control 40% of sugar production, 75% of arable land, they owned 50% of the railways, 100% of the oil refineries, and 90% of cattle ranches. Um, US banks held more than a quarter of bank deposits. So um, that was the situation leading up to the revolution, and homosexuality in Cuba was very specifically outlawed. The Cuban Penal Code enacted in 1938 originated from Spanish laws and was in force till 1971. Um, that law penalised habitual homosexual acts, homose homosexual molestation, scandalous indecent behaviour and ostentatious displays of homosexuality in public. So, um, and Cuba was very particular, although I think other Caribbean islands also saw this development in that capitalist relations had consolidated the sex for profit industry, um, which had given mass expression to homosexuality and feminine expression in males and shaped these as commodities on the auction block of the market. Now, some writers refer to Cuba, pre revolutionary Cuba, as a US brothel. And um, this is indeed uh, researched, I think, more researched certainly than, uh, than other Caribbean islands. But prior to this revolution, the Mafia developed um, a very incredi incredibly large and important to Cuban economy, underground um, prostitution, sex worker ring, um, tourism, very much in line with um, uh, the sex trade, um, and all very much targeted towards US American tourists. So that's very important to understand, because when the revolution happened, that was gotten rid, uh, gotten rid of. That was wiped out. Um, but also, we have to understand that homosexuality, not just in Cuba, but all over the world at that stage, was very underground, very much based in the cities, but very much underground and in these scenes. So there was a, uh, about 200,000 gay, most, mostly talking gay men here, um, pre-revolution, but in that, in that community, in that organised mafia and around that underground community. So, survival for this community, and there's a couple of writers who have, who have um, researched this, often meant engaging in fake heterosexual marriages or banishment to the gay slum. Existence for queers in Cuba paralleled that of other countries at this period. So another quote from um, a researcher, Havana of the 1950s was not easy for the working class or petty bourgeois homosexual. Unemployment was high and had been steadily increasing throughout the decade. The scarcity of production op uh, productive occupations demanded a strictly closeted occupational life. For all women, especially for lesbians, employment almost invariably entailed continual sexual harassment. Aida, a lesbian seamstress now living in Miami, remembers at work, you had to pretend to have a boyfriend all the time, make up stories, even get someone to accompany you to work once or twice. If not, you're in trouble because they'd be after you every day, every hour, every minute, caressing you, showing off their genitals. It was hell. Okay, so revolution. Um, the very exciting bit. So uprising, general strikes, um, students, workers, peasants, um, land bred freedom. Um, out Batista, out, out US, out. So the revolution happened January 1959, um, the 1st of January, and it was a mass popular revolution, mass involvement. It consolidated political and economic power in the hands of the Cuban poor and away from the US. Specific measures, land reform, restricted ownership to 1,000 hectares. Um, between August and October 1960, 41% of land was expropriated, 95% of industry nationalised, 98 percent of construction, 95 of transport, 75 percent of retail and 100 percent of wholesale trade. Um, and there was a massive increase in the social wage, free health care, um, rents down to 10 percent of um, 10 percent maximum on, on wage. Um, life expectancy rose, um, numbers of inhabitants um, fell in the same period, infant mortality stood at 
um, a very, very low rate at 1990 in Cuba, it's 10.2% per thousand births. Um, and it's estimated if the Cuban Revolution hadn't happened, one million people would not have lived past the age of five. So that, that brings it home. After the revolution, all laws discriminating against blacks were removed. Women's rights were enshrined from January 1959. They won full equality under the law, including pay equity, the right to childcare, abortion, um, and the right to enter into military service. And of course, many lesbians benefit from these programs. The mafia-controlled prostitution trade was broken. However, LGBTI people did not fare as well as women and Afro-Cubans in the early stages of the revolution. Now, that Cuba was anti-gay can be summarised into three main arguments. Um, that is, UMAPs, which were um, the, how, it's very specifically, um, military camps or work camps, manual labour camps, um, Mariel migration and HIV sanatoriums. So involuntary quarantining um, HIV sanatoriums. They're the three arguments that opponents of the Cuban Revolution, backed by the United States of America State Department, argue that's, that's why you shouldn't support the Cuban Revolution, it's homophobic. Well, um, now, the revolution changed everything, turned everything upside down. So the world in which LGBTI people could seek comfort and social experience and expression completely transformed. Um, and so many of the rich Cubans left, um, and a lot of the gay, richer gay men and some of the lesbians left uh, with them, um, but some of them stayed. And the more reactionary elements and the poorer, more pro-working class elements got thrown together for comfort in wherever they could. Um, and the CIA targeted these groups, the vulnerable LGBTI community. One famous case was of Rolando Cubela, a homosexual leader in the Revolutionary Army, um, who was very good prior to the revolution, but got recruited by the CIA to try and assassinate Fidel. So homosexual bars in La Rampa. La Rampa is uh, on the Matacone, and it's, uh, I went and visited there in Cuba. There's a whole bunch of transgender uh, sex workers, youth and old, gay men, lesbians, hanging out um, every Friday and Saturday um, in great numbers, drinking and talking and chatting. So La Rampa um, was seen as a counter-revolutionary space um, and began to be treated as such by the revolutionary government. So um, then the context, of course, is the invasion, attempted, intent, attempted invasion in 1961 of Playa de Grón. So this new revolutionary state had to defend itself and it started to organise in the CDRs, the Committees of the Defence of the Revolution. It organised the population, the 11 million people, to defend the revolution and the gains that the population were working ferociously for health, education and dignity. Um, so in, there was a hyper, hyper um, awareness of the threat of invasion at this period. And so there was military camps instituted and they're called UMAPs, Military Units to Aid Production. Um, an author of a book about the Cuban Revolution's early years, Jose Iglesias, noted that UMAPs were to take care of young men of military age whose incorporation into the army for military training was considered unfeasible. Young men known to avoid work and study were candidates so were known counter-revolutionaries and also immoralists, a category that include homosexuals. Um, Ian Lumstan, who is the author of a seminal book, Machos, Maricons and Gays, um, Cuba and Homosexuality, noted, homosexuals were among those most affected by the woman camps, but there is no evidence that these were created with homosexuals exclusively in mind. Together with homosexuals, the camps contain such sexually incompatible companions as Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, conscientious objectors to military service whose religious faiths were notoriously homophobic. Um, and there's quite a bit of research on um, the UMAPs, but one of the um, most famous persons in, uh, placed in the UMAPs was Pablo Milanes, who is Cuba's most famous singer and songwriter. And, um, and so that gives you a bit of a, 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 a feel to who was put in. Um, in 1992, Fidel Castro said, I'm opposed to any form of repression, contempt, scorn, discrimination with regards to homosexuals. It's a natural tendency and must be respected. 
He was also talking about the Umaps at that point in time and apologised for, um, for them. Now, the other thing about the Umaps, um, which needs to be noted, they lasted for three years and were temporary. And they were closed down after protests were made by the Cuban Union of Writers and Artists Federation, UNIAC, and also Raquel Rivieta, who had been a prominent Cuban Communist Party member before the 1959 victory. So Lumsden's uh, opinion on this is that um, the, the, the homos, homophobic charge of the UMAPs is not really based on too much at all, um, and that they were caught up, there wasn't a, a, a conscious aim to, to round up them. However, um, Lodges Arguez and Ruby Rich comment, while short-lived and denounced extensively within and outside Cuba ever since their abolition, the camps remained a damnable episode in revolutionary history. And actually, I think that that is that out of all of the experience in the Cuban Revolution, um, this does point to the the most uh, the hardest three years uh, to be a homosexual in the Cuban Revolution. And everything up, up past the UMAPs has been positive and a development um, and an advance. Um, okay, so we're going to look at the good stuff, which is the advances from 1970 onwards. And 71 was a really good year. And if you have a look at this timeline, 1971, the first National Congress on Education and Culture, whereby... For the first time in an official document, homosexuality was referred to in medical and psychological rather than criminal terms. Um, however, the Congress was a little contradictory because it also launched a policy of parameters, which meant people had to meet specific dress codes and behaviour regulations to gain access to certain jobs um, and public positions. They also, at this point, said no homosexual should officially represent the country. So, contradictory. But mostly, um, some positive things came out of that conference. So, in that period um, as well, importantly, um, 1975, the limits on employment of homosexuals in the arts and education were overturned by, overturned by the Cuban Supreme Court. So, the negative, one of the negatives coming out of that um, education conference was overturned in 1975. Um, which ruled in favour of gay artists who were petitioning for compensation and reinstatement in their workplace. So that was 75. In 77, the Cuban National Group for Sexual Education was established, headed by Cuban physician um, Celestino um, Loja Chair, Lohan Chair, and an East German sexologist, Monique Klaus. And the East Germans were very, very, very sexually liberated, um, and they had a very good influence on the Cuban um, approach to sexuality. Uh, a new Cuban national group for sex education worked primarily with those involved in health and education, and that developed and started to form. So, 1979, also very important historically, homosexual acts decriminalised, but failed to legalise manifestations of homosexual behaviour in the public sphere, leaving intact anti-gay laws dating back to 1939. Um, in 79, transgender issues started to be discussed as well. Um, and in 87, the offence of homosexual acts in public places was, was removed from Cuba's penal code, um, but homosexual behaviour still suffered legal restrictions until the 90s, namely 1993, where unequal age of consent laws were removed. So people might know that Queensland uh, still has unequal age of consent laws in this country. So Australia, last state, we really need to uh, abolish that. But in 1993, Cuba got rid of those discriminatory age of consent laws. So, um, and then there's a little bit more on, on sex education. Very interesting. So, uh, I don't know what people's experience of sex education was. I went to a private school in year 10. I got told that abstention is the best form of contraception. My sister, who had a much more progressive biology teacher, got shown a banana and a condom, but I got nothing. I got sick, and, um, and I had to join resistance to find out that sex before marriage wasn't going to get you into so much trouble after all. So, um, so it is then a global south country with this incredible Catholic um, experience. Then in 1975, um, off they go, the life of males and females produced, and that was sent to health practitioners and schools and so on. It was also put on bookshelves in Cuban stores, 
but it was too popular, so they had to stick um, some uh, them in paper bags because you'd stick them on the bookshelves and out they go. Um, and that book was very, very, very good for homosexuals. That first one. Um, and it basically said that it's a natural experience. Then there was another book that came out afterwards, after a bit of backlash, which wasn't so uh, wonderful, but it didn't say that homosexuality is a psychological illness, which of course the World Health Organization ran on until 1993 again. So, um, you know, this, is, this, is, this was pretty mild stuff. Now, the other thing is the Mariel boat lift, which is the other, accusation of um, Cuba being homophobic and so this is 1980 um, and economic sanctions were biting of course the US has had the longest and most um, uh, detrimental economic sanctions against Cuba out of any country uh, that any country has experienced in the world um, so with sanctions biting more than a hundred thousand Cubans um, some counter-revolutionaries um, and petty criminals and also homosexuals, and we'll go through the reasons why, left Cuba in a boat lift for the US. Um, the United States said that there was, um, I think it's, they charged that 10,000 um, Cuban homosexuals left, but actually there's, there were activists in the New York Village Voice um, say that about 3,000 gay Cubans came through their doors and they were um, specifically targeting the gay Cubans that left at that point um, to assist them. Uh, so the US exaggerated. Um, the, that LGBTI Cubans wanted to leave Cuba. Um, the reasons why are commented by Urco Yes and Ruby Rich. So throughout the late 60s and early 70s, Cuban gay and lesbians continued to migrate in small numbers to the United States via a third country as direct migration was still prohibited. Family reun reunification was a shared goal. However, there is a new, 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 <laughs> that's the one, a very particular gay reason for leaving. The age old pre-revolutionary tradition in which families encourage gay offspring to immigrate in order to avoid family stigma. So there was a real need uh, for gay Cubans, queer Cubans, to leave their homeland and their family because of the stigma tied, uh, tied to their same sex loving. The other thing is that the exploration of another country um, and another community of potential lovers um, was also really important. So black male from the United States was another reason as to why homosexuals left. So Carlos Alberto Montaner, a Madrid-based anti-Castro writer, published two full pages listing names of homosexuals inside Cuba in an attempt to discredit them and encourage them to migrate. So out of them. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing was that the US immigration um, unofficially lifted the part of the Immigration Naturalization Act of 1952 that had been used to bar and deport those that labeled sexual deviants but they only did that for homosexual Cubans. So they opened the door. Um, they encouraged, they opened the door, they blackmailed, um, they targeted. Um, and in an interview with Ignacio Ramonte, Fidel Castro acknowledges this history of discrimination that led to gay and lesbian migration. The revolution promoted the struggle against di distinct types of prejudices. In relation to women, there were prejudices, and very strong ones and also in relation to homosexuals, that society emanating from injustice was saturated with prejudices. Certainly homosexuals were the victims of discrimination. In other places, much more than here. But in Cuba, yes, there was discrimination. Okay. Okay, now, the other thing, um, just to go through a little bit more the laws. Um, I mean, we've gone through it here, but people can have a look, little bit more of a look. Basically, anti-homosexual laws getting lifted, um, and 1993 really is is the um, um, is the end point to where really it is very hard to find anything that specifically relates relates to homosexual act, whether it be public displays, um, age of consent laws, and so on. Okay, so HIV AIDS, um, pre-revolutionary healthcare in Cuba was for the rich. After the revolution, half of all Cuban doctors left the island and went to capitalist countries. In 1981, HIV AIDS was first 
diagnosed in the United States of America. Now, there was demonizations of people with HIV AIDS in particularly New York and San Francisco, and the figures of the death rate of that, the gay male community are astounding. Um, I, it's one in 10 died in San Francisco. Um, and so it was like a, a war. Um, people were walking around, um, you know, in shock because a lot of their lovers and friends had just had died three or four years after getting this illness, which they were demonised for. It was called the gay plague um, by the theocons, the right-wingers in the United States, and AIDS was a gay disease. Well, in 1985, the first case of HIV was diagnosed on, in Cuba, and from then, Cubans spared no expense and mobilised against AIDS. Um, not against people with AIDS, but against the disease. Um, they tested, doctors at that time tested more than 135,000 Cubans for HIV, and in 1985, um, they spent $3 million to buy reactive agents and equipment to set up labs in blood banks, um, hygiene and epidemiology centres around the country. In 1985, Cuba also screened the entire island's blood supply, which, if you think about it, um, that is incredible. The year later, in 86, they opened three sanatoriums that provided care for 99 people, only 20% of who have thought to have contracted HIV through same-sex loving. Now, that was involuntary, um, but they could leave at night and go visit their families, um, or afternoons, go visit their families and so on. They needed a certain, uh, certain amount of supervision, but people could come and go. Um, but they had to come back to 24-hour care. So, that's not the case anymore. Um, and that um, involuntary lasted, I think about, again, maybe a few more years than three, about five or six years. Um, certainly now, um, people are given a one-week session in these sanatoriums, which is a Living with HIV course, and they are paid full-time weekly wage to attend that course, and afterwards they return to their job. Um, and this outpatient system is run parallel to the option of living and participating in the sanatorium system. Some gay couples choose to live together in the sanatorium. That also happened in, in the 80s as well. There were gay couples living together, there were heterosexual couples living together in the sanatoriums. And the infection rates in Cuba are the lowest in the region with 3,200 cases out of a population of 11 million. Now, I actually think that the way that they dealt with this was fabulous. I do not think that it targeted the homosexual community in any fashion. In fact, if you look at the early figures of 20% of the 99 people who had been diagnosed with HIV only being homosexual, it's pretty clear that the government did not target specifically the homosexual community. They did not, there was no media right-wing lambastation of people with uh, HIV like of what there was in the United States of America. And I also think that if you're talking about a, uh, an island of 11 million people with a severe economic blockade mm -hmm. against it where they cannot in, import drugs, retroviral drugs, then the Cuban government took the right position. And there's a, there's a, a very important argument about everybody's health, everybody's health, um, not just the individual that um, maybe wants to do this, that, that and the other. So, um, again, not a homophobic policy by the government. So then, let's just go through a little bit more. 1993, really great year, Strawberries and Chocolate, a film criticising Cubans' intolerance of homophobia, was really exciting. There was, you know, that was the number one state-produced uh, film of the year, and there was blocks and blocks and blocks of people lining up to see it, and they had to play it over and over again. 1995, Cuban drag queens led the annual May Day procession, joined by two queer delegations from the US. Um, Gay Cuba was produced by Sonia de Vries in 1995, um, and again shown to public and critical acclaim, not just within Cuba, but in, at the International Festival of Latin America. Um, Pablo Milanes, uh, 1996, dedicated a song to gay men um, and to all Cuban homosexuals, and that was very popular. In December 2000, at the film festival in Havana, easily half of the Latin American films shown had gay themes. So this is a, um, culturally, we are seeing great advances. When I was there as well, what they had was ads on the television, very sexy ads, with, um, with uh, men and women and bars and breakfast tables 
and, um, and a little bit of silk here and there. Um, but what, what the main message was, was that homosexuality is not the disease, but homophobia is the disease, and no to prejudice. And that was on state television. That wasn't on, a, on, on at 11 at night. That was on at 8 p.m. Um, that was on during the day. And that was very inspiring to see. We don't have that on the ABC or SBS in Australia. We don't have that kind of approach, um, that campaign against prejudice and bigotry. So um, the head of the International Gay and Lesbian Association, who is um, Carlos Sanchez, visited Cuba in 2004 and said, Sexual minorities seem to be living better in better times now in Cuba, in the medium term, even better than the rest of Latin America. Uh, in December 2006, a transgender bill was presented at Parliament from Senesex, which is the main sexual rights group headed up by Mariela Castro, who is Raul Castro's daughter. Um, there are free transgender operations now in, in Cuba, and in Australia, if you want to transition um, and you need surgery to, to transition, then you uh, have to go and prove yourself as gender dysphoric to a psychologist or a psychiatrist to get hormones, which may or may not be free depending on um, how you go about and who you speak to, uh, and they can be very expensive, but also you can be spending up to $14,000 to transition from female to male, um, and you can spend $20,000 to transition from male to female in Australia. Most people don't transition in Australia, because Thailand is better and other countries are better. Trans operations in Cuba are exceptional, um, they are well renowned and, um, and ILGA and other organisations have acknowledged this. Okay, so um, he's also talking, ILGA also talks about the development of organisation of the LGBTI community, which since, two, uh, since 1995 um, when they headed May Day, they've been developing rallies on International Day of Action Against Homophobia. Actually, the first one was 2005, um, and every year since they've had rallies um, on that day. So, what I want to do is very quickly compare what we've got. So, in the United States of America, LGBTI people suffer hate crimes. People might remember Matthew Shepard, um, who got brutally murdered uh, down south and he, that was a brutal murder in 1999. Transgender deaths uh, in the US are very common. Transgender imprisonment in the US is very common. Um, so there's hate crimes. There are no hate crimes against LGBTI people in that brutal, assaultive way in Cuba. Um, there is no laws that discriminate against LGBTI people in Cuba on the books anymore. Instead, there are public campaigns for people to overcome their prejudice, which is this inheritance from uh, Catholicism, but also from um, the US turning the country into